The sermon today is taken from James 1, verse 1 to 18. This is the word of God. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let, lo let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its, flowers, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under a trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that, he, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Thus says the Lord. Thanks, Indit. Friends, let us pray one more time. Lord, we're dying, Lord. We are in a fallen world uh, that is full of temptations and hurt and struggles, and we need you. We need you to speak to us and to give us guidance as to what to do here, as to how to make it. Lord, I pray that your word today can nourish us and encourage us and refresh our souls that we may be able to see your truth and your beauty and that we can have encouragement for our lives and it changes us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we finished last year in our series on the book of Moses and now we're starting a new series on the book of James. The book of James was written by James who was Jesus' half-brother, right? Same mom, different dad. James was a prominent leader an elder and pastor in the early church. And he wrote this to give Christians guidance as to living in a hostile environment. Now, notice in verse 1, right, how James described the early church. He calls them the 12 tribes in the dispersion. If you've been studying the Bible for a while, we'd know that the 12 tribes can only mean one thing, Israel. That's made of, of 12 tribes. Now, where are the 12 tribes? They're in the dispersion, the diaspora in Greek. What this word means is that when a usually ethnic group of people are living in a place where they're not originally from, in a country that that's not their home, right? If you remember how last year, when we were in the book of Exodus, Israel was in the wilderness, where there was all kind of trials and temptations, and they were on the way to the promised land that God has promised them, their permanent home, but they weren't there yet. You see, they were in the dispersion. So James was comparing the situation of the earlier um, followers of Christ to Israel. And this is also our situation. The Bible says that for Christians, this world is not our home. That we're born in it and we live in it for now. We're actually citizens of heaven. And we're waiting to go home, but in the meantime, we're living and working in a foreign land in a foreign culture with values and practices that may be contrary to our values. And this gives us anxiety, fear, and potentially conflict with the culture around us. Perhaps some of us have experienced this, right? If we're Indonesians and we went abroad to study and after spending a few years abroad, we come back and we feel like foreigners more than locals. 
especially at times when you're driving and the lanes here are more like suggestions than actual expectations of you. And we don't sympathize with the identity of the culture we grew up in anymore. And so we're struggling right, to readjust. And it's stressful, and we're experiencing this kind of like reverse culture shock. But maybe for some of us, the way the world works is actually what's familiar. And Christianity is what actually feels foreign and weird. Right? Maybe you're a new Christian, and you, know, you meet a community of Christians, and they're touching each other and like closing their eyes in public. And, and saying things out loud and they're asking you to do the same might be weird and scary. And if this is you, I don't think that that necessarily means that you're not a citizen of heaven. I think this happens when we've just become Christians or we've been away from Christianity and for most of our lives we adopted the culture of the world, we live like the world, we've been influenced by the values of the world and we feel more at home there. So the book of James is actually helpful for both groups of people, both those who are used to being Christian and feel this discomfort from the culture of the world and those who are newly Christian and are still getting used to Christianity. Interesting fact. The name James is actually an English way of saying the Hebrew name Jacob. The Greek, uh, and the Greek name is Jacobos. Right? And who is Jacob in the Old Testament? He's the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the letter of James is not like some good advice from a life coach, right, from a moral teacher, but it's loving words of wisdom from your mom and dad, giving them to you for when you're going through a hard time. This is at the heart of the book of James. So what we're looking at today is only the introduction to the book of James, and it's like a trailer, right, that gives you all of the themes that James is gonna cover in his letter. And to start off the series, instead of having three points, as usual, I will have two. Joe did this last week, and he wasn't fired, so I hope you'll bear with me. And I'm doing this because th this is how James structures his teaching, right? And so we're trying to follow along with him as closely as possible. So if we read uh, James 1, we can notice that James has two main points. First, the present purpose of our trials. Second, God's promised blessing. So, one, the present purpose of our trials. The first thing that James teaches the church who is struggling to adapt in this hostile environment is that we need to have the proper perspective on the trials that we face. Right? Check out verse 2. When, not if, you meet trials of various kinds, consider it joy. Right? James knows that life is hard, and the Christian life is not going to be stress-free, trials of many kinds will come, and you're going to feel like you're struggling. Right? And just so we're clear, right, what I mean by trials is basically any sort of suffering. Physical illness, emotional hurt, financial struggles, shame. Basically, any time we are made aware that we're not in heaven and that we're living in a world populated by sinners just like ourselves who sin against each other. So when this happens, when you have this realization, don't beat yourself up. Don't pity or hate yourself. Don't think that God is punishing you, but consider it joy. And joy, right, is not mainly talking about a feeling of happiness or cheerfulness, but it's an attitude. Something that makes you genuinely look at your circumstances with positivity and hope even if they're difficult, something that doesn't go away when you're hurting or suffering. It's how Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison, he can say that although he is full of sorrows, he's rejoicing. But why? Why should we have this positive attitude when we're going through trials? Verses 3 and 4 tells us. Because these trials are tests of faith that produces steadfastness or endurance. And, in, and that endurance has the effect of making us perfect. Now, what is steadfastness, right, in our translation? The word here also is that has the meaning of perseverance or endurance. In the Greek, it has this image of being able to carry or bear a, lo a heavy load for a long time. So James is saying that the trials are like workouts, exercises for our faith, right? Trials make our faith stronger, last longer. In other words, they increase the capacity 
of our faith. What is faith? Right? It's more than just belief. Theologians call faith the instrument of our union with Christ. It is the gift of the Spirit through which we're able to know God personally and deeply. It is what makes us able to see His goodness in our lives. So the purpose of trials is that so your faith can become stronger and that you can know God better and glorify Him more and that you're more sensitive and aware of His goodness and faithfulness in your life so you can enjoy Him more, right? And what is the purpose of having stronger faith? Why should we want to know God more deeply and be more frequently aware of His goodness for us? Verse 4 tells us that the full effect of having the strength and faith because of endurance is that we will be perfect, lacking in nothing. Now, the modern understanding of perfect is that it has no flaws. There's nothing wrong with it, no blemishes. But the Greek word here actually communicates something more like functionality and wholeness. Right? It's like my car, it has some blemishes on it, it might have some scratches on it. Last night there was a cockroach in it. But it's a perfect car. Why? Because it gets me from point A to point B safely. It's functioning perfectly as a car. So James is saying that a holistic, properly functioning human being is one who knows God and is actively fellowshipping with Him. Even if we have our blemishes and flaws and cockroaches. If we can do this, then we're a perfect and whole person. Right? Because this is what God designed humans to do in the first place, right? In the Garden of Eden, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve just as I am talking to you right now. He made us so that He can be with us, so that we can know Him and enjoy His presence. Like our statement of faith says, right? Chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So James is teaching us that we can consider going through trials a positive thing because in these trials, our faith is going to be worked out and exercised and it'll be stronger. And when it's stronger, we can, glorify, we can be closer to God and we can glorify Him and enjoy more. And then, when that happens, then we are functioning as a human being. We're working as a person. Right? But... I understand that for some of us, this might seem hard to believe, right? Because some of our trials can seem overwhelmingly hard and intensely painful. Right? Think of the hardest trials that you fear, right? the death of a loved one, a breakup or divorce, a betray betrayal of a close friend, shame, right? And in fact, the trials of the early church were severe like this, right? In the early church, it, people could be taken away, put in prison, and killed for their faith. They might know someone who's lost an arm for their faith. And especially in these severe, intense kinds of trials, we could be led away from God instead of towards Him. We may even end up being disappointed with God or angry at Him. And James understands this. So in verses 5 and 8, he gives us some very practical advice as to how our trials can actually work to strengthen our faith and deepen our relationship with God, and we can enjoy His love more deeply. So look at verse 5. James tells us the problem, right? That we're not considering our trials joy and not being worked out because in order to be drawn closer to God instead of away from Him in our trials, we need wisdom. Now what is wisdom, right? Wisdom in the Bible is not so much an intellectual or mental thing. It's not just the same as being smart or clever. It's more like being skillful. In Exodus, there was this guy called Bet Betzalel. He was a craftsman who was said to have wisdom in working wood and metal, and, that, and because of that, he was in charge of making the Ark of the Covenant. Right? It's like how if you do counseling with Tazar, he has wisdom in counseling because he knows what to say at the right time that makes, makes you right in the heart. Right? Or if you watch sports, right? and you watch football, and you watch Messi play, you know that he somehow knows that when a defender is here, and the ball is here, he can touch the ball this way, and shoot, and somehow will score. He has this instinctive awareness of the situation and ability to execute what he wants. Right? So our trials are leading us away from God, and are distancing ourselves from Him, 
is because we don't have this skill. We don't have this instinct to come to Him when we face these trials. So how do we develop this skill? How do we grow in wisdom? James simply tells us that we need to ask God. Why? Because God will give this wisdom generally, generously to all, without reproach or discrimination. Because God is not trying to hide from us. He's not trying to be mysterious so that we would seek Him more. Right? He's not like a teenager who has a crush on a girl and he doesn't reply to him intentionally just to make her squirm a little bit and miss him more. He wants us to have wisdom. Right? He doesn't want us to be weighed down or crushed by our trials, but to be able to rejoice in the middle of it. So how do we ask God? Three main ways. Praying, reading your Bible, going to church. Prayer is the way we come into God's presence. It's the way we communicate what is in our hearts to God, and it's how we let God's presence affect us. The Bible is God's authoritative word. It's how we know who He is and what He says. Everything that we know that is true about God ultimately comes from the Bible. In other words, it's how God answers you when we ask Him. And church is where we hear God's Word preach. It is where we are reminded of what He says and is where we can receive wisdom and, and help from a community of people who've gone through trials probably similar to yours. So we can walk with you, love you through this trial and can get through the trials together. Right? So James is teaching us that if we're struggling to see God's goodness and love for us, and we're struggling to enjoy Him in the middle of our trials, we need to have wisdom, the, instinct, the instinctive skills to do it. And only God can help us to grow in this. And we can ask Him by praying, reading your Bibles, going to church. I cannot emphasize this enough. Right? It is crucial for the Christian life, irreplaceable. But maybe some of us here are saying, I tried that. It didn't work. Tried praying, read the Bible, went to church. I'm still miserable. I'm still suffering. Still don't have joy. Maybe verses 6 to 8 can help us out here. Right? Verse 6 tells us something important about our hearts when we come to God. That when we ask Him, right, we must come without doubt. What this means is not that we cannot have questions about God and what He's telling us. It's not that we have to force ourselves to believe even though it doesn't make sense to us. Coming without doubt means that we come in humility and submission, whereby we acknowledge that God has the answer. We don't. It acknowledges that God is our Creator. He loves us. He wants us to receive joy. He wants us to know Him. It is trusting Him while acknowledging that the problem is with us. Right? There's something wrong with us, and He knows how to fix it. We don't. It's the same mentality that we have when we're sick and we go to the doctor. Right? We go to the doctor not to demand that He just magically heals us. That's a dukun right? or a shaman. Right? We come to Him to ask how to be healed because He is qualified to know. He is the expert, and if we don't doubt our doctor, we would take the medicine he prescribes us and we'd adjust our lives according to what he says so that we can be healthy. And so we go to God not just to demand that he just miraculously takes things away, but mainly to be guided by him. Right? For him to tell us why we're not rejoicing in our trials, to show us how and why we should be joyful in the middle of them. Right? Then, verses 6 to 8, even tells us why coming to God like this won't work. Because the doubting person is called double-minded. His heart is divided. He is labil, right, in Bahasa. He is inconsistent and he vacillates from one way to the other. It's like there are two voices speaking to him. The illustration given here is like a wave of the sea being tossed around. Okay, maybe I can make this more clear. Let's say, let's say, you are considering to date or marry someone. 
And you say, this per and, and let's say this person is actually someone who you could have a beautiful and blessed marriage with. But you have your doubts about this person. Why? Because deep down, if you're completely honest, it's because this person is not attractive enough. And because of this shallow reason, right, we become double-minded about this person. And if we continue, we force ourselves, for whatever reason, to marry or date this person before we can see how they're beautiful on the inside, and before we deal with our vanity and our idolatry of beauty, we'll still be holding on to the doubts. And therefore, we'll only ever partially commit to this person. And it's going to be rough. Right? Because we'll end up being super sensitive to their flaws and being overcritical about them. Right? So we're going to feel constantly disappointed by the relationship, second-guessing it or even regretting it, while our partner will be constantly exhausted and discouraged and always having to prove themselves to us. It is because our doubts have created this confirmation bias. Right? And we'll be much more aware of the reasons why we shouldn't be in the relationship more than what is actually good about it. So similarly with God. If we come to Him with this doubting and double-minded attitude, we'll be waiting for God to confirm our doubts instead of being open and obedient to His leading. You see, we're going to have this confirmation bias. So when God works in a way that we don't expect, we're going to be like, oh, I knew it, I shouldn't have trusted you. We lose faith. And when we're double-minded like this, we're going to be looking for reasons why we shouldn't follow God. And even when we try to follow Him, we'll be reluctant. And so we won't receive the joy and obedience that God can give us in our trials. Do you see how this is not going to work out? Right. And so what does that look like? Right. How does not being double-minded and coming to God without doubt can give us wisdom that draws us closer to God? Verses 9 and 11. James mentions a case study that he will go into later in the book, right? Trial of poverty and riches. So we see in verses 9 and 10 that there are two opposite sets of circumstances that are both presented as trials. There is the lonely, right? Lowly, not lonely, which means that he is from a low socioeconomic class, and there is the rich. And we can see that James presents both <clears throat> As trials. Now, maybe some of us are going, sign me up, Lord, for the trial of riches, right? Lead me to that temptation. But James is saying here that both of them can fall into sin. And both need wisdom in order that their circumstances might draw them closer to God and not away from Him. So on the one hand, right, we have the lowly. For whom the temptation is to be disappointed with his life, to feel insignificant because he's fixating and obsessing about what he doesn't have. And so he wouldn't live a life of joy and gratitude because he believes that life is only good if he gets what he doesn't have. He can be envious and he can resent God for not giving him the riches that other people have. Now what is James saying? If the lowly Christian has wisdom, he would be able to realize that he's actually exalted. He's been made rich in Christ. He's a prince. And that he can be joyful in the situation, even though he's made poor in the sight of the world, but he has a heavenly Father who has surpassing riches, and you can bless him more than you can ever ask or think. And you can satisfy our every need. And he has an inheritance waiting for him when we come back to him. And it's in this should the lowly person Take pride. On the other hand, we have the rich, for whom it's so easy to be prideful about the gift of wealth God has given them. He can be so satisfied with the pleasure and prestige this gift gives him that he forgets the giver. And so he can fixate and obsess about gaining and keeping wealth. He can use wealth to find his identity and value and love it so much that he neglects what is truly valuable. And eternal. So what is James saying to him? That he needs, the rich man needs to realize that he is humiliated. Not that he's embarrassed, but made humble. That he is a sinner in need of grace like everyone else. And that 
the only reason why you can enjoy these things is because God is surpassingly gracious. Not because he's a better person, a more moral person, a more spiritual person. And as verse 10 and 11 says, that his wealth is temporary. And if he doesn't humble himself and realize that he is nothing without the Lord, he will fade away. He will die and or his wealth will disappear, whichever comes first. And then he'll have to face God. See, James is giving us examples of people with different circumstances, but can be similarly double-minded. Both can doubt that their relationship with God is ultimately what fulfills them, right? So they can be hedging their bets, diversifying their interests, because their hope is also that money and status will make them whole too, and perfect, and it's not going to work. Both needs wisdom to see their lives in light of the gospel but through different angles. The lowly through seeing his value in Christ and the rich through his misery without him. Right? Both can, should be taking pride in being satisfied in the Lord and it is when they are in the Lord and not when they have what they want, money and status, that they will be perfect and holistic and functional human beings. You see? Only then will they be satisfied. So, We've been talking a lot about how we're supposed to handle the trials in our lives. But what is God's role in all of this? Or what does God do? How does God give us strength and the ability to keep on going? So point two, God's promised blessing. So in verse 12, it states that the person who is going through these trials and whose faith is being worked out and strengthened in these trials, this person is actually blessed, right? And to be blessed means that God's favor is upon you, right? That they're going in the right direction and that God is with them. Not that, not that. God's favor or blessing is some kind of reward for enduring these trials because that's not what the reward is. But it's saying that someone whose faith is growing in the middle of these trials is someone who is already blessed by God. In other words, endurance is a condition, is not a condition for blessing, but it is an indication of a blessed person. And why is this person blessed? Because the person who has God's favor will be rewarded in the end by a crown of life, right? which he has promised to those who love him. What James is saying here is that in our trials, that we need to have this heavenly-minded approach. Just like the sufferings in our life is temporary, the happiness in our life is too. But there is an abundance that God promises us when we get to Him, right? When we've run the race of this life, we will return to the palace of our heavenly Father and He will welcome us home. There's something greater, better, eternal waiting for us. But maybe, maybe, some of us are asking at this point, hold on, if God promises us a reward and God is in control of everything and God allows us to go through these trials and I'm tempted to sin because of these trials, doesn't that mean that God is causing me to sin as well? but he's also promising a reward. What is he doing? Is he messing with me? And it's, and it's this kind of question that James tries to address in verses 13 to 15. So what James tries to prevent here is for us to blame God for our temptations. Temptations do come in a period of trials, right? And it is these very temptations that we need to overcome to produce this endurance, this workout intended by the trials. But James is saying that why we're tempted is not because we go through the trials, not because of the trials, right? Because the book of Hebrews says that Jesus was tried and tempted like we did, but he was without sin. But James says the reason why we send these trials is because our hearts are sinful and fallen and it naturally desires to sin, right? So, for example, the trial may be 
being of a low socioeconomic class, being lowly. Temptation comes from the envy in our hearts. It's disposition to covet the things that we don't have instead of being grateful for the things that we do. Or the trial might be wealth. The temptation comes from our pride or greed or our tendency to think that we're better than other people because of what we have and to desire to gain and keep as much as, as, much as possible for ourselves, you see. Or maybe the tri trial is loneliness and the temptation is lustful and sexual desires because our instinct is to fill the desire that we have to be loved to be valued, to be desirable through sexual indulgence. You see, does it make sense? The reason why we're tempted in the middle of our trials is because of the evil in our hearts. It's because of sin. It tricks us, it messes with, with, with us and makes us think that the things that God prohibits are the solution to our problems. If we give in to these desires, we will sin. And if we keep on sinning, the sin will grow. And when the sin grows, we'll run away from God and not towards Him. We won't love Him or enjoy Him. And ultimately, the result is death. Instead of the crown of life that God promises as a reward for those who love Him. So don't get it twisted. God is not trying to trap us and catch us sinning. He wants us to see that with Him, we're able to overcome our sinful desires. He wants us to see and experience that if you are in Christ, you really are free from sin. And He does this by leading us step by step, fall by fall, to victory over our temptations in these trials. Because through wisdom in Christ, there is a way that we can endure these trials and get closer to God. So that, like the hymn says, right? When in the, our darkest hour, when temptation claims the battle and it seems like the night is won, right? Deeper still holds the anchor, even though we are accused, right? So we need to anchor our souls in Christ. Brothers and sisters, this world has fallen into sin. It is populated by sinners like ourselves who sin against each other. And so before we get to heaven, we'll be facing these trials continually. We'll have to bear the grief, disappointment, suffering, pain, shame that these trials bring. And ultimately, we're going to have nobody to blame but ourselves because we actually deserve to suffer in these trials. And without God, there's no reason why we wouldn't be ultimately crushed by our trials. Life would be just a repetition of going through trials, somehow toughening up and getting over it if you can. Meanwhile, trying to enjoy the small, fleeting, temporary things until another trial happens and hopefully this trial isn't great enough and then the cycle repeats and then you die. But thank God. Right? Our Creator, our Father, whose love for us is eternal, without variation or shadow of change, that He gives to us every good gift, everything we need to overcome these trials. And the only reason for this is because He gave us already the greatest and most perfect gift of all, His only Son, our Lord Jesus, who is the Word of God Himself, out of his own will came down from heaven, put on corrupt human flesh, lived in the corrupt, fallen, sinful world. He endured every suffering and every temptation that we had. Yet he was without sin. And he endured the greatest trial, the trial of the cross. And he took on the death that was meant for us. And he did that so that we can be born again no longer a slave to sin, no longer under the control of the desires of the flesh, but free to obey and worship God, who is right now in the process of renewing all things of, 
in creation, and we are the first fruits, right? We who confess in Christ are the first to be recreated in this new creation. And this comes through a process of working with us, with our sin, as He grows us in our faith and draws us closer to Him, turning us into His image. You see? And when Jesus finally comes again, He will totally end all sin, all suffering, all shame. He will wipe away every tear and will receive from Him the crown of life. And finally, we'll be perfect, glorifying God and enjoying Him forever. Brothers and sisters, if right now you're going through trials, don't do it on your own. You can't. You can't make it. Come to God who wants to help you. Cast aside your doubts and humbly Ask Him for wisdom in your trials. Make Christ the anchor of your soul so that you can taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, who are we, O Lord, that you would send your Son to us? Who are we, Lord? that you do not allow us simply to reap the fruits of our sin, but you have sent your Son to deliver us from death through dying himself. Lord, as we live in this sinful world, as the outer man is dying, pray, I pray, Lord, that you can send your Holy Spirit to renew our inner man, to refresh our souls and continually turn our hearts upon you, that we may receive joy, through whatever trials we have, because you are the one who strengthens us and you will call us home where we'll be perfect and we'll finally be with you forever. In your mercy, Lord, we pray.